Um, we are going to cover a lot of ground on this panel, so get ready. We're going to go from China to elections to rebuilding cities uh, in a thoughtful way. Uh, we've got a great set of uh, panelists here today. John Podesta uh, probably needs uh, no introduction, but John, why don't we um, start with you um, and the President's announcement on China. And maybe you could help us understand a little bit about how that came to be and what it means as we, not only in terms of reducing greenhouse gases, which is obviously the key part of it, but what it means in terms of where the world is going as we move into the post-Copenhagen uh, meetings in Paris. Well, I, uh, thanks, Carol. It's nice to be back at camp. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just start off. Um, and thanks, Mira, for everything she's doing to, to lead uh, this great organization. So, um, well, let me, let me put a little bit of, of perspective. I won't, I won't start with the sort of timeline about how this happened, but it's, I think it's been clear uh, for, uh, you know, the last uh, more than a decade that China and the U.S. seem to be the kind of leaders of the two opposing teams. And it was very important, I think, to bring uh, the, uh, the two countries together and at the presidential level to really begin to tackle the climate challenge. So uh, starting uh, early last year, uh, early this year, uh, in February of uh, 2014, uh, Secretary Kerry suggested to the Chinese that we begin both technical work and the, the idea that we would both uh, try to put our post-2020 commitments when uh, the, which is the context for the new negotiations on climate change, that we would come forward with our post-2020 contributions uh, to the international uh, arrangements to get on a path to two degrees uh, centigrade uh, rise in uh, and, and limit the rise in global temperatures to two degrees C. Um, and the Chinese at first were, you know, uh, they took that on board. Uh, I'm not sure that they were uh, uh, completely understood what even we were proposing, but uh, through diplomacy that was uh, led by Secretary Kerry and the State Department, included the White House, uh, and, and particularly uh, uh, between direct communications, uh, in both uh, by letter and in person, mm. uh, between President Obama and President Xi Jinping, uh, we came to the idea that, that this could be an important announcement to galvanize these uh, global uh, discussions that, that take place under the UN framework. Uh, and uh, the president met with the uh, executive vice premier of China at the UN summit. He, had, he was representing China there. Uh, and they had a conversation that said if both sides could come forward with ambition, with ambitious uh, targets and, uh, and that they could be done together, uh, that would be a very important moment for the for the world, and that's and so we uh, needed. I think both sides needed to understand at a technical level what we were committing to, and we think our number is quite good. Uh, puts us on a straight line path to the to the uh, reductions that are necessary uh, for advanced economies to hit uh, the targets that were embed included mm -hmm. in Waxman Markey by 2050 that you worked on uh, so diligently. Um, and so we think our number is very good, and it's doable, and it's achievable with current authorities that uh, uh, Administrator McCarthy just talked about. And the Chinese came forward with uh, two commitments. One is to peak their emissions around 2030. There's been uh, some you know, back and forth about uh, could they wait till 2030. Absolutely not. Uh, they have to get going right now in order to be able to hit that, hit that mark. Uh, because they have a lot of momentum in, in uh, a, a rapidly growing economy. Uh, and another target which came forward, which I think is really even maybe perhaps more significant, which is to put, uh, which is to uh, hit 20% uh, of their uh, overall energy base uh, from non-fossil uh, uh, targets. That's a combination of renewables and and nuclear, so that's a, that's a very significant number. To give you just some perspective, and then I'll shut up. Uh, that's uh, they're, they're, um, they have made a commitment to build as much non-fossil energy today as they're bur uh, in by 2030 as they're burning today from uh, coal fire power. So they're building a whole nother China with just renewables and nuclear uh, between now and 2030. 
No, I mean, clearly historic, and I think the, the renewable, the, the non-fossil fuel part is, is very tangible and, and great, great news. The, you know, we've heard from some of, some of our opponents on this issue uh, that, well, because they get till 2030, you know, it's not real. But obviously, as we all well, know, that, you have to get going. That's, it's like not saying, like you. that's like saying we don't have to do anything till 2025 right. because our, we have a 2025 number in our, in our, uh, uh, in, in our contribution. Uh, and of course, that's ridiculous. You have right. to get going to now get going. in order to be able to right. make the, those right. uh, numbers by, by those periods of time. The other thing that I think was significant was uh, they, uh, and in direct conversations between President Xi and President Obama, uh, they said they would uh, try to go early, and I think they can go early. It's our estimation that they can, that they can peak earlier in the, in, in the decade, uh, and particularly with that build out of renewables and, and, uh, and other, other non-fossil energy sources, uh, that they can, they can hit an earlier peak, and that'd be a very good sign for the world. That'd be a great sign for the world. Tom Steyer joins us. Um, so Tom, you did something that a lot of people wanted to do, tried to do, but weren't able to do, which is you made climate part of this election debate. And uh, we thank you for that. Uh, there were, I think, every single Senate race, there was at least a debate where the issue, if not many debates, where the issue of climate and, and uh, climate change and uh, global warming were, were on the table. And so talk a little bit about how you did that and what you think that means as we move into the presidential. I mean, clearly what John and President Obama have done by putting these targets out there for the Paris meetings is sort of said, uh, you know, this needs to be part of our debate going forward. We need to be thinking about this, not just this year and next year, but into the future. <laughs> And you were out there with the voters. So tell us what you saw and, and how that happened and what do you think can happen going forward? Let, let me take one second before I answer that question to say I think we all owe John Podesta yeah. and the entire team a round of applause yep. for what I think is a real accomplishment. <laughs> so I'm mean, a perfect example of cap at its finest. Um, you meant President Obama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I meant the whole. I meant John because he's here, but the whole, the president, the whole administration. Um, in talking about climate and energy around the country in 2014, I think we um, found that what has been true for the last five years in our experience, which is that if you talk in generalities, if you talk in uh, from the point of view of the globe, and if you talk from the point of view of science, you're in a lot of trouble. Basically, for this issue to resonate with people, you have to speak on a hyper-local basis, and you have to speak on a human basis. So that when Gina McCarthy was talking about the impact of, on health, or when she was talking about the impact on economic growth, those are the things that people relate to in terms, this is a huge pervasive issue in terms of jobs, and people need to understand about the specific jobs in their state and their community. In terms of health, in Los Angeles, 20 to 25 percent of the kids have asthma. That is a real visceral issue for the people in that area. It is, however, that is an issue that is very local and specific, and so that it is unrealistic to ask the voters in Florida to lie awake at night worrying about the drought in California. And it's unrealistic to ask the voters in Iowa to lie awake at night, worried about the fact that salt water is running down the streets of Miami Beach. So what we found in the, the, was in order for this to matter to voters, it had to be a human issue that was occurring in their community. And that is a question of, are there jobs being created? <clears throat> Can you at least show people specific jobs, not green jobs in general, that are promised in huge size? without any specificity, because people aren't interested in jobs in general. They're interested in specific jobs for specific people, for themselves or people they know. And the third thing that people really react to is I think that we found that around the United States, and I'll give you a quick story from California, but people are very worried about the idea that money in politics is getting special privileges. And to the extent they ever see that, an actual connection between political, uh, favors and any kind of contribution, they are very upset about it. So I'll give you an example. We ran a proposition in 2012 in California that had to do with closing a tax loophole. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we were doing a focus group. It was a very complicated proposition. And we were trying to explain it to people. And we were using focus groups where you get about 50 people and explain it to them and see what they say. 
So it's Friday night. These people are very tired. They don't like our moderator. They don't like our proposition. We have a rogue focus group. <laughs> that they, they're all going to vote against us if they have their chance. So the moderator left the room, and he came back in, and he said, I'm gonna do, he said to us, I'm just going to try something different. So he went back in, and he said to these 50 people, look, we're trying to close a tax loophole. Some lobbyist passed this at midnight when all the legislators were tired. They didn't know what they were doing. It's costing the state of California over a billion dollars a year, only to companies from out of state, only to companies that don't employ Californians or who have facilities in California. That just doesn't seem right. So we have these somewhat tired, angry people on a Friday night who went from being a rogue focus group that wanted to skewer us that they wanted to get that lobbyist and those companies as soon as possible, and they would do anything to turn that around. And we see that in the United States, those three things. People are very worried about if doing something in this really gonna hurt jobs. Is the framework of we can heal jobs or a good environment true? How is it impacting people's health and livelihood, you know, kind of the well-being of their families right now? And is there something in this system that's wrong? So when we see we can see this from 2014 putting huge pressure, not just on Democrats in terms of trying to do the right thing, but for Republicans trying to adjust their position to the increasing sense around the United States that the science is settled. And so we've seen there aren't many sci science deniers anymore because it's just you can't get elected as a science denier. It's, it, no one trusts someone who denies basic science at this point in the United States. So that's why we've seen that whole spate in 2014 of, I'm not a scientist. That is actually a huge advance from, I disagree with the science. I'm not a scientist is, I'm an agnostic, I don't have an opinion. But I, as of yesterday, John Thune, who is a Republican senator, came out and said, we know it's happening, we know human activity contributes to it, we need to decide what to do about it and how much that will cost. So I think what we're seeing is not just Democrats and particularly young active Democrats who really care about this, we're also seeing Republicans trying to figure out a good way to respond to this issue intelligently and yet under pressure from a whole bunch of sources who are trying to push them away from just addressing it directly. And I think that's gonna happen throughout the 2016 campaign on both sides of the aisle. How much can you inspire? How much can you move to a reasonable place? Look, a, a debate about what do we do whether versus whether we do something is uh, it, it's progress. So thank you for what you've done. Uh, Judith, Judith Roden joins us from the Rockefeller Foundation where she is, you know, uh, Tom said that you have to make the issue hyper-local, you have to make it human. You are right at the center of thinking about um, how to do that, how to uh, rebuild our cities, how to rethink infrastructure investments uh, in our cities. I know you were part of the commission after Sandy. Uh, you've taken it well beyond that. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you see in terms of the opportunities? And, you know, Tom just talked about the jobs uh, and maybe a little bit of what you guys are seeing around the world in terms of uh, both the, the investment opportunities but also the jobs as you think about rebuilding infrastructure in a resilient manner. Um, pick up where Tom left off, which is this issue is really hyper-local, and we are seeing around the world amazing energy and amazing innovation in mayors and governors who really get it. They have to deliver every day. There's no Republican or Democratic way to pick up garbage uh, or fix the snow or respond to floods, and they really know that. So it's been really exciting to work at the more local level also, as Tom said, the climate change that's already occurred is hyper-local. It's very hard, whether you're a Republican who hates science <laughs> or not, to be in Louisiana and not confront the fact that Louisiana is losing an acre of land every hour in the wetlands. Imagine that, a football field every hour. And so when you start to think about the lower Mississippi and the ecology, the the commerce, the activity that it has generated for the United States over the last century, and the capacity it has to do so again, unless it continues to get eroded in this really extraordinary way, taking a hyper-local approach, not only to engaging and developing allies, but also developing solutions. So 
we're working to help cities, communities in the US, let's stay in the US, We've, we are working around the world, um, but in the United States to really become more resilient. And resilient means, and we spend so much money in the United States on disaster recovery and relief, billions and billions of dollars, 150 billion just in disaster recovery in the last two years. If we invested some proportion of that in making our cities and our communities more resilient to the natural disasters, the storms, the climate episodes that are already occurring and are, are occurring with increasing fury. So we see in cities in the US, resilience building begins with good planning. Take San Francisco, for example. San Francisco, but also um, Norfolk, Virginia, El Paso, Texas, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, we see in, in those cities and many others extraordinary integration across all of the operations of government and across uh, government with local businesses, with civil society. They really plan and prepare, not for the last crisis, but for any crisis. In New York, after Sandy, we had most of our generators in the basement because we were preparing for what happened in 9-11 and we expected to get attacked from above. And then of course they all flooded. So you can't become resilient and you can't prepare by looking in the rear view mirror. The second phase of resilience is really in how we recover when a disruption does occur. And so in, again to use a post-Sandy example, um, in both New York and New Jersey, Governors Cuomo and Christie have been very aggressive in using some of the re federal recovery funds to buy out homeowners in the most flood prone areas. It makes enormous sense. 500 homeowners have already taken the program. And those lands, which, in, which are in the lower, lowest lying coastal areas, are being restored as coastal buffers and wetlands and recreation areas and they will protect the surrounding communities. So how you recover, we can't just build back the same anymore. That's how we've been spending our fe federal disaster recovery funds over the last 25 or 50 years. So build back better, build back smarter. And then the third phase of building resilience is in revitalization. And revitalization really starts in how you develop the recovery process. So again, with to post-Sandy examples, um, in uh, uh, the south shore of Staten Island, uh, living breakwaters are being created in the waters instead of uh, concrete you dikes. You need to explain what a living breakwater is. So a living is. breakwater <laughs> is actually earthen berms and uh, textured material, green sponges, that will restore the nat natural habitat. Staten Island used to be one of the uh, strongholds of the oyster economy yep. in the last century in the United States. So this will restore the oyster reefs, restore the natural ecology while creating wave and storm erosion buffers. And this project is also including public school education and community involvement. It's what I call the resilience dividend in my, in my new book because you're getting triple wins for one investment. That's revitalization or the Meadowlands in New Jersey, which is now integrating as a result of some of the federal recovery money being used more flexibly, is, is integrating transit routes, recreation areas, green space. Both of these are amazing examples, the Meadowlands in particular, in the way they're designing new development of a new frame for what we must do in the United States. And that's learn how to live with water. We can no longer pave and pipe and pump every time something happens. And so how we restore really will matter in our 21st century capacity to live with water, while these two <laughs> create the efforts that will mitigate against future climate change. You, you know, know, I, I began- Carol, if I just say one thing, uh, picking up on, on what Tom said about what John Thune said. Uh, Where's the cost? This conversation's really directing you r right to where the cost is. The cost is in the status quo. The cost is in doing nothing. Right, right. The cost is in uh, taking on these tremendous costs to taxpayers right, right. Uh, from having to pay for extreme weather events, big disasters, et cetera. The future 
the strength in the economy is from making this transition. Uh, and that's where, the, that's where the job growth is going to come from as well. So I think we've set off now forces that will uh, create a virtuous cycle of innovation, of invention, of building uh, new technology. And just as we've done in the past, we're creating a new economy that's built uh, on a more sustainable foundation and where uh, people not only will have the upside of being able to go to work to produce that economy for everything from the highest tech uh, innovators to you know, people installing that, uh, those kinds of, uh, uh, of new innovations, but uh, to do nothing is to bear enormous cost uh, to the side. And, and Tom's report last summer, I think, demonstrated mm -hmm. that. Well, John, I, where I, do I the businesses fit in? Let's talk right, for let's, a second about business, because I think that you know we, that's that's gonna that's always an important part. And you know, you're talking about some of the new types of businesses in the new economy, but we have a lot of traditional businesses. And how do we bring them into this? And how do we get their support? So, I, I think there are two things to be said about the business. One is. I think it's important for us to have a framework for the interaction between government and business. Mm -hmm. And so American business is famous worldwide for innovating, commercializing new ideas, and bringing them to market all over the world, all globally. So when we're what we're thinking about here is for the government's role, though, has a real role, which is to set up the framework so business makes good decisions. And in, the ca in this case, in terms of carbon pollution, what we really need is to make sure that the polluter pays for their pollution. Because if you think about how businesses make investment decisions and how they make decisions about what businesses to go into and where to spend money, they're basically running computer programs where they're projecting revenues and projecting costs and coming up with returns on their investment. And if you don't include some of the costs, then you're going to go out and make investments that are actually not particularly good from society's standpoint because you're going to make a good return based on your computer program. So the government's business, and this goes back to probably the 17th century, is to make sure that all the costs are included in your computer program so you make good decisions, both for your company and for society. So when we've seen that, when government does that, which is an absolutely basic function of government, we've seen businesses do an incredible job. If you think about information technology in the United States, we had basically a monopoly until 1983. And then government broke up AT&T. We deregulated information technology in 1996 through 1998. And we've had an explosion of innovation, not mandated by anybody, but people looking at the opportunities and coming up with them. So when we think about how this is supposed to work, there's an absolutely essential function for the United States government, which is to enable businesses to do what they do best, which is to optimize within a framework. And that's, you know, we should be, I find it very amusing that some of the most supposedly business friendly publications and mouthpieces are arguing that this is an, you know, we can't do this, it's too expensive, we'll never come up with it. In fact, in history, when we've challenged American business to do things, to solve problems, mm -hmm. they've yep. done it better, faster, yep. incredibly, and then everybody looks back and goes, well, of course we would do that. We have to set the frame. Well, EPA regulations, just to put in a plug, are full of examples of industry saying, no, we can't. It will be too expensive. And once the regulation is set, once the standard is out there, guess what? You've created a market. And all this innovation, ingenuity comes along, and we get there faster, cheaper. Judith. We see business understanding this so very well. So for example, Walmart has set a goal by 2020 to increase by 600% their ability to create on-site renewable energy. They're doing it because it will yield benefits in the good times in terms of energy efficiency, but also it will give them capacity to be more resilient if anything hits them and takes at the area around them down. So businesses get this. We see Deutsche Bank choosing their uh, service centers uh, in terms of which cities are the most resilient. They want to put their businesses in places where cities have plans and they really have the capacity to respond effectively. And they have good plans for carbon reduction and they have good plans for carbon emission. In our 100 Resilient Cities initiative, we've had 800 cities from around the world compete for 100 slots. And in addition to the innovation of receiving a chief resilience officer, 
um, which is someone who really will think about these big picture issues all, all in an integrated and, and very cohesive and community building way, a, a transparent way, the cities all have access to a platform of goods and services. And we've been overwhelmed by the private sector companies jumping onto this platform of goods and services, from Palantir doing big data analytics to Swiss Re creating new kinds of risk assessments and catastrophe bonds for municipalities, to large bank consortia that want to do resilience bonds for infrastructure financing, to 3D printing companies who understand that for 3D printing, these areas are enormously rich and fertile, and to those who really are about sensing mechanisms on the Internet of Things, because our capacity to be more resilient depends on awareness and sensing. So these are huge engines for economic growth, and our business sector gets it. So John, how do we bring the Republicans into this conversation? I, mean, I think we all agree it's changing, the, the American people are, are moving on this issue, but how do we, here in Washington, bring the Republicans in? This is, this is the hope springs eternal part of the conversation. <laughs> exactly, before we go to the audience. <laughs> You know, I think Tom sort of said it earlier. <laughs> we released this week, we, uh, President put together a bipartisan uh, state, local, uh, mm -hmm. and tribal uh, task force to, to, to focus on resilience and, and give recommendations to the federal government how, about how they can be better partners uh, in all of the work that, that uh, Judith was just talking about. And uh, Jim Brainerd, who's the mm -hmm. Republican mayor of Carmel, Indiana, was, uh, we uh, met with Vice President Biden and released a report on, on Monday. And basically, you know, what he said was he gets, he, he, he takes a little <laughs> bit of guff from his uh, Republican allies, but what he says to the people in his community is, look, I'm saving you money. Yeah. I'm producing uh, a more sustainable community. Uh, and, um, you know, those are kind of conservative values. And, uh, you know, we can see what's happening around us. And so I do think this is going to be a kind of bottom-up exercise. Uh, Tom is a little more generous on the I am not a scientist than I am. <laughs> I wasn't I mean, generous. I think that's largely, I think that's largely. You don't think the issue's gone away, the I am not a no, scientist? No, that's a dodge. That's yeah, a, you know, totally. that's a like Luntzian phrase to <laughs> kind of get out of the conversation and pretend uh, that, uh, and try to hide uh, your antipathy to kind of actually tackle the uh, climate challenge. Uh, so so he's, he, but, he's a little more generous about that. But I think that people, young people, young Republicans, uh, get that uh, climate change is happening. It's caused by uh, human activity. The carbon pollution we're pumping into the atmosphere, the other greenhouse gas pollutants we're pumping into the atmosphere are changing fundamentally the, the environment. And they're doing it in a way that's, that is very challenging uh, to our ability to grow in a sustainable way and, and uh, lead uh, good lives in, into the future. So when you look at, you know, maybe it's a little bit like other social movements, you look at young people first uh, and young people across the political, political spectrum are, are moving on this and I think that uh, Washington is a lagging indicator here. So the leadership on Capitol Hill is, you know, they're in to total denial and they're into uh, kind of fighting efforts uh, to deal with, uh, with uh, this huge challenge that the country faces. But I think that's the, uh, you know, they, they, got, they got rewarded, I guess, for that, uh, uh, you know, uh, at, dur during this uh, midterm election. But I think over the long haul, that's a very losing proposition. Well, can, Carol, can yeah. I make a couple points? And then on we're going to go to the audience. One is there, there's a poll that just came out today from Yale University, Tony Lazerowitz, that specifically polled millennials in terms of energy and climate. And include, there's a vast proportion of them who absolutely want something done on it, including about 46% of Republican millennials. <laughs> so the, John's point about you know, the young people, this is an issue where they're not equivocal. This is an issue where they're not equivocal. What's and wrong with the other 54% of those Republican <laughs> it's, millennials? It's I'm just curious. <laughs> well, that's just but The there's other point job. is this. I think that they're it, listening to, to podcasts from Mitch McConnell. <laughs> <laughs> I th well, it's, this is a very partisan issue. But I think the other thing that has to be remembered in this, uh, in, in thinking about it, is 
that on October 30th, so just a few weeks ago, the head of Americans for Progress said to a New York Times reporter, so, and it was printed on the second page of the New York Times, so it's not a secret, said anyone who support, any Republican who supports a carbon tax in 2016, we're going to oppose very seriously, and we're going to make it very I think they said, or the EPA regulations, right? Mm. Did they say both? Uh, or just a carbon Americans tax? Americans for prosperity. Americans for Support prosperity. Support a carbon for tax or regulations. Or regulations, right. So in thinking about this, I think it's only fair to understand how much pressure Republican office holders are under from interests within their own party who are directly in the New York Times, so it's no secret. They're mm -hmm. overtly saying, if you do this, we will come after you. So yesterday, there was a vote, which for those of us who oppose Keystone, good vote. But we saw two more Democrats move on the issue, all right? We saw Carper and Bennett go from being opposed. Do I have this right? Someone help me here. Yeah, I do have it right. Where it is. Um, does that give you pause? No. Uh, you know, from my point of view, when we look around the country, uh, in the states where we've been active, being wrong on these issues has not paid off for anybody. And so being equivalent, I, I think that my interpretation of the 2014 elections is not standing up for the things you deeply believe in is not really a great idea. And I think on, in this case, particularly given the way that activist Democrats and young people across the country feel about this, not standing up for the things you really believe in in an attempt to protect yourself uh, didn't work. Didn't doesn't okay. seem like a winning strategy. A question. No, we, we can't see you guys. I mean, we have these lights in our this one face. Here. Why don't we go right here, Joe? Hi, you have to, yeah. I, I could actually see him, so I knew who it was. <laughs> I don't know if they can fix the lights. Uh, Joe Rome, Climate Progress. First, I wanted to echo Tom's statement, John, that I, I think that the China deal, I personally think, is, is your greatest and most game-changing achievement in a lifetime of them. And, and it, it has impacts in, in, in terms of the climate agreement we may see next year, in terms of uh, ensuring that renewable energy prices continue to drop as they have and that, and that fossil fuels uh, are left in the dustbin of history as but one example of, of how it's already caused China to act now dramatically. The, the government of China announced today that they would cap coal uh, consumption in 2020, which of course you have to wow. peak in coal, coal because it's easier to do than peaking in gas and, and oil. And I'm just wondering, I heard you on, on Charlie Rose talk about what it's like to deal with the Chinese. Um, uh, they move slowly, but once they move, it's it's everywhere and it's all in. I just wonder if you sort of discuss what it's like That's negotiating nice. with the Chinese and, and what you think <laughs> this means. Uh, I mean, they don't have a Republican-led Congress. Uh, and, and, There's and no what, Mitch what McConnell. What you think this means in terms of I influence throughout China in, in, in what the changes are going to be in that country? Yeah, look, I think, look, they're, t they're, t they're tough and good to negotiate with, and they're not doing this for us, they're doing this for them. Uh, they have a huge uh, air pollution problem, yeah. uh, but they could have, uh, I think, made a commitment to solve that problem without addressing climate change, and they didn't do that. Uh, they, uh, they're doing some activities that probably, you know, I wouldn't recommend if you want to try to tackle both uh, at, at first, but, but for the most part, they've, they've taken on board that climate change is a direct threat to China, uh, and, in, and in particular, the, the party feels a threat to their ability to govern China if they don't address uh, these tremendous air pollution problems that they have, water pollution problems that will be exacerbated by climate change, et cetera. So uh, at the very top of the Chinese government, including all the members of the Standing Committee, they've come together, they've agreed uh, to these numbers. Uh, that will be embedded in, in national law when the uh, People's Congress meets next spring. Uh, that's already, I think, been decided, uh, and when they want to move, they move. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that a decade ago, uh, the if for those people who are engaged with China on energy and climate, they said, well, yeah, but the national government mm -hmm. can do this or that. But at the local level, you know, people make their own decisions. 
Uh, I don't think that's true in this case. I think there's a, there's a direct political commitment because uh, they understand that their economy depends on it, uh, their structure of their, uh, of their government, and you know, uh, for the good or the ill, uh, the ability of the, of the current leadership in the party uh, depend on addressing this problem. It's being demanded by the people. And I think that they, you know, they'll, they will go ahead. It's not that, that it's because we want them to, it's because they know they need to. But um, uh, 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 Judy said something very important, and I think Tom echoed it, which is what this will do is to set off a cascade of investment and innovation. So uh, the two biggest economies in the world getting behind a strategy that's moving towards low carbon solution, more renewables, will drive down costs, uh, drive innovation, uh, and build, uh, I think, again, the, the, the true industries of the future. You know, my, my sense in talking to the Chinese is that very, and you sort of reference this, very similar to what happened in the U.S. in the sort of 60s, early 70s, as you had the sort of anti-pollution environmental movement taking hold, is that as you had a more secure middle class, people started saying, you know what, we don't really want the polluted air and water. And so I think the politics of this for, for the Chinese officials is, is not dissimilar to what our own politics were. You know, EPA gets created and a whole host of environmental programs. Um, unfold. I just want to say one thing. I happened to be in India on a CAP uh, uh, track two dialogue while the um, John and the president were in um, China, and so uh, we got a heads up the announcement was coming. So we shared with our Indian colleagues, who some are former government officials, some are on their way back into the government, uh, business, uh, NGOs, and uh, we've had this dialogue. John started it what four years ago, and I've continued it now, and uh, they were stunned. I mean, I, they literally couldn't believe that, both things, that the U.S. had put numbers on the table and that China um, had stepped forward. And you know, this is tricky for India. They're in a very different part of their development arc uh, than, than China is. Uh, but it was such a testament to the magnitude of what you all had achieved. I mean, they literally just sat there and looked at us and silence. But Carol, they have an almost green fields opportunity exactly. that neither China nor we have. So um, Rockefeller is working on what we're calling smart power for rural development in India, which is to build mini grids yes. in rural areas using only alternative energy, whether it's wind or biomass or solar, using the cell phone towers as, quote, the anchor tenant who can take about 50 or 60 percent of the load. They're currently on diesel, so it's a completely it's a complete, clean yeah. energy play. It's a development play because the villagers and microenterprise then get a reliable source of energy. The Modi government actually loves yeah. this idea, so there may be another way in to get them to reduce some of their, think, you know, change yeah. their thinking about their reliance on coal as their only route to development. You know, we talked about this program, and one of the interesting things that we learned was that when people in communities, villages, are told this is happening, their first response is, we were promised the grid. We don't want this. It's we, want, we want the grid, because that's like what, you know, means we're like finally on the map. <laughs> So they have to be educated. Of course, what happens is this is a much better deal. Totally. On all accounts. But it's just such a sign of what pro how progress has been defined now has to be redefined And for it's people. making markets. So you're right. creating alternative energy companies. So there's real enterprise now, significant mm -hmm. um, medium-sized enterprise in thousands of villages that didn't have that size enterprise. And so people would stream into the cities, I think. McKinsey said 76 people a minute yes. in India move into a city. They know that's not sustainable. So, but you're right. The, uh, they have the to be rural people, people need to be, to be educated but, that but this is progress. But if you think about it in terms of information technology, it's like the copper wire versus the cell phone. Yes. We're never running the copper wire to a lot of places. Right. right. But, they're gonna, but everybody has exactly. a cell phone now. Right. No, that's exactly right. We just have to get people to think about that. Um, right there, I'm sorry. The, woman right here. Can we get her a mic? Hi, I'm Kristen Mugford. Uh, my question's for Tom. So Tom, I completely agree with you on the power of business to innovate, particularly when government is sort of setting the box as you described it. Um, but I'm not a scientist, 
And I guess one of my questions is, if you think about the role that the NIH played in, in funding kind of early science on things that weren't necessarily commercializable, yeah. do we need sort of the equivalent of that in this case for us to hit the goals that we have set out, or will business innovation be enough? So um, I think that's a, a great question. Um, and basically, there is an absolute role for government. When you think about R&D, research and development, American businesses don't really do multi-decade research into projects that cost billions of dollars that may produce something someday. And yet, when we've seen the great innovations that tons of development has come out of, they very frequently come out of research done by the US government. And think about the internet, which came out of DOD. So when we think about what is necessary and for, for this innovative cascade to happen, one of the things that I believe is necessary is for an ARPA-E-like uh, effort, which I believe has been extremely successful, has been a fantastic return for American taxpayers, is something that is absolutely necessary in which I, I think one of my good friends back in California is a extremely outstanding 94-year-old Republican named George Schultz. <laughs> and George always says, the only two things we need to set off this process of innovation and change is to spend government money on research, because it isn't happening otherwise, but it's absolutely essential. And we need more. We need RPE, but we need RPE on steroids. And we need to price carbon. And those are the, that's the framework for George, where he's consistently said that those are the two government functions that as a you know, 94-year-old Republican, <laughs> I can absolutely support and I feel allow business to get to the place where they can do the function that they do, which is carrying out the kind of change that's absolutely necessary. I, I would just add to that, I totally agree on ARPA-E and, and actually the former head of ARPA-E, Arun, is on the track two dialogue that we were in India on. But I would add a second part to it. Which, is, which we saw in the Recovery Act, which is there are times when the government should not only invest in uh, the research and, and development, but occasionally we have to invest in actually launching the technologies for a variety of reasons the private sector may not be there. And you know, the, 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 you know there's many stories that have been told about the Recovery Act. Uh, the final story that's gonna be told and is being told right now, it is profitable that these businesses grew they're able to pay back their loans, and you know it's part of launching a whole new industry in this country, an industry that will now get a further injection of sort of government support, this time through regulations, not necessarily through money. But you know there are times, I think, when it's not just the uh, research side, it's also a little bit of money to kind of get that out into the marketplace, improve that technology. It can be hugely important. And you know, we have a long history of doing that through the tax code. And in fact, we have some tax breaks that go on the books. What, when, when, did, when did the gas, when did the oil companies get their breaks? In 1919 or something like that? You know, they were a nascent industry. They got their breaks in an effort to help launch the car industry in the United States. Now, they still get their tax breaks, which is not something that should be happening. But you know, there's, a, there's some models here that we can use to help launch these Chemical industries. And, and, and in applied also. So ENIAC was the first mainframe computer that also came out of federal funding looking for a mechanism to begin to collate what they saw were vast amounts of data that government wanted access to and be able to use and inform decision making. And of course, in our free and open research model, when it's government funded, corporations are able to take it up and use it and develop it. And out of that grew the whole mainframe technology industry that fueled so many of the other technology industries we're talking about. So it is an amazing investment for the American mm -hmm. taxpayer and something that we ought to keep doing over and over again. Okay, so we're about to be out of time. So I wanna ask our panelists very quickly a last question. Um, you know, things are changing in DC. Many of us have been through these changes before. They goes one way, then it goes another way. Are you optimistic that we, our generation, we have younger people here, but our generation will address climate change in a responsible manner? I'm, I, I have to note that I'm in an older generation. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're covering the, the late 50s, early 60s up here. <laughs> so are you optimistic? Sure. 
we can do yeah, this. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the the uh, uh, you know, as my ex boss used to say, don't bet against America. Nice, Judith. I am too because seeing what's happening at the local level, at the state level, and watching the kind of action that uh, the president's team was able to produce over the last few weeks, I really am optimistic. And I'm, I'm optimistic for a couple reasons. One is we're seeing people talking about energy and climate all the time on the front pages of the newspaper from both sides of the aisle. Yeah. So this is something which has gone from being not discussed at all to being discussed all the time at the highest levels. And the second thing I'd say is when you look at how change happens in society, it, it's, there's a famous quote from Hemingway, how did you go bankrupt? Two ways, slowly and then all at once. <laughs> <laughs> how is this going to change? With a lot of talk, slowly, people changing their minds, thinking about it, it percolating, and then all at once. Yeah. Thank you all very, very much. And please thank our panel. Thank you. <laughs>